Hello, I'm Brian Tate, and I am pleased to welcome you to the, to, to the 2020 Brooklyn Book Festival. We're here today with authors Paolo Giordano, Mark Honigsbaum, and Sonia Shah. Before we begin, I want to let you know that books by the authors of this program can be purchased in the links below. I'm going to read very brief uh, author bios uh, that were provided by the book festival. Uh, Mark Honigsbaum is a medical historian, journalist, and author of five books, including The Pandemic Century, 100 Years of Panic, Hysteria, and Hubris, and The Fever Trail, In Search of the Cure for Malaria. He is currently a lecturer at City University of London. Paolo Giordano is a physicist and the author of four internationally best-selling novels, including The Solitude of Prime Numbers, which has sold over a million copies worldwide. His essay, How Contagion Works, published in Italy at the beginning of the coronavirus emergency as The Mathematics of Contagion, was shared more than four million times and helped shift public opinion in the early stages of the pandemic. Sonia Shah is a science journalist and the prize-winning author of Pandemic, Tracking Contagion, Tracking Contagions from Cholera to Ebola and Beyond, a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the New York Public Library Award for Excellence in Journalism. She has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and many others. Her TED Talk, Three Reasons Why We Still Haven't Gotten Rid of Malaria, has been viewed by more than one million people around the world. Her most recent, books, her most recent book is The Next Great Migration, the beauty and terror of life on the move. She lives in Baltimore. Welcome to you all. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So uh, to get us started, uh, I have some questions uh, to ask you all. Um, and I'm hoping for a very lively conversation around this topic. Uh, I want to invite uh, anyone who would like to read something of their writing uh, to help get us grounded um, uh, to please do so. Mark, I, I think you had mentioned that you had uh, uh, something to share. Um, I, do, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to dominate by reading too much. Well, um, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a, it's a very big book. I will, I could just read a short passage. Um, that's fine. And, and let me say to you and to the others, if you have yeah. two or three paragraphs you'd like to read to help get us started, uh, please do. Um, uh, and we can dive in from there, or we can dive in, uh, whatever feels right. So um, I should just say that, um, so I, I wrote uh, The Pandemic Century, actually I began writing it in 2017, um, and I actually finished it at the end of 2018, but it didn't come out until April 2019. Um, but of course, as soon as uh, the COVID-19 outbreak started, within a matter of weeks, my publisher was on to me saying, you know, could you, is there any way you could update it with a new chapter on COVID? Um, as you can imagine, I'm sure as Paolo um, can appreciate as well, um, it's rather challenging writing about um, uh, a topic like this when you're in the midst of it and there are so many unknowns. Um, so I just want to share uh, like a brief passage um, uh, that kind of describes my frame of mind, what I was going through. So um, I was writing this in late March um, in London, when London was on, under lockdown. Uh, and, well, I'll just read it. I'm writing these words from my sick bed in London. It is March 26, and I'm nursing a temperature and an intermittent cough. But because of the lack of National Health Service testing kits, I have no way of knowing whether I have COVID-19 or a cold, much less when it will be safe to hug my 88-year-old mother again. Several friends have reported worse symptoms, including an unsettling loss of sense of smell and a diminished sense of taste. Just as China was too slow in responding to the warning signs in early January, so the British government has been too slow to follow China's example and impose the sort of draconian measures that might have halted the spreading infection chain. Instead, the British public, like Americans, have been asked to practice social distancing in order to flatten the curve. Terms that until last week, few people had heard of and even fewer could define. 
And then it continues. 100 years ago, when the planet was swept by a similarly devastating plague, the world was at war and the Spanish influenza made curiously little impact on the collective consciousness of society. Americans took little notice of the pandemic, remarked the environmental historian Alfred Crosby, then quickly forgot whatever they did notice. The Times of London was similarly puzzled by the pandemic's failure to leave more of an emotional residue. So vast was the catastrophe and so ubiquitous its prevalence that our minds, surfeited with the horror of wars, refused to realize, opined uh, a leader column in the Times in February 1921. The quote continues, it came and went, a hurricane across the green fields of life, sweeping away our youth in hundreds of thousands and leaving behind it a toll of sickness and infirmity, which will not be reckoned in this generation. Even now, just three months into the pandemic of COVID-19, there seems little danger of the coronavirus being similarly forgotten. Indeed, newspaper columnists are already referring to the pandemic as, quotes, our new historical divide. And looking forward to the first year AC after Corona. When that will be, however, no one can say. So uh, that was written obviously in April, but I think that um, we're still obviously right in the midst of it, so nobody can really say when it's going to end uh, and you know when this new post-corona time might begin. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Sonia, would you share, care to share something? Um, sure, I can share um, a little extract from the new forward I wrote for my, <clears throat> my book, Pandemic, came out in 2016. And uh, we just put in a new forward in, I guess I wrote it in the spring of 2020. Um, for me, the most striking aspect of this pandemic is how eerily familiar it feels. According to taxonomists, SARS-CoV-2 hails not only from the same family of viruses as its fellow pandemic-causing pathogen, SARS-CoV-1, but from the same species. The elder SARS virus had emerged from the bodies of bats through the intermediary host of civet cats, thanks to the peculiar opportunities available in a rapidly expanding Chinese economy, which had increased the probability of novel intimate contact between people, bats, and other wild creatures. The first SARS had erupted in 2003. The balance it had struck between contagiousness and deadliness led to its burnout after infecting more than 8,000 and killing hundreds. But the virus producing factory that led to the first SARS virus had never been shut down. It was only a matter of time before another virus with a potentially more successful combination would emerge. Indeed, its younger sibling, just a little more contagious and a, le a little less deadly, would best its ancestor by far. It first made itself known in late December in a cluster of cases of severe pneumonia in Wuhan, China. At first, local authorities refused to believe the infections were anything out of the ordinary censoring those who dared to suggest otherwise, just as government officials faced with novel outbreaks had in the past. Belatedly, societies around the world woke up as if from a dream into the nightmare of the pandemic. Numbed by the scale of the threat and the mass mobilization short-circuiting it required, leaders around the world fell upon worn metaphors. France was at war with the infection, its president said. China would wage a people's war, its president said. The US president would be a war president. But a war required an invasive outsider to single out, repel, and destroy, an acts of force to quell it into submission. It pitted one opponent against the other. The widely distributed virus, already as well incorporated into bodies and societies as cotton thread woven in fabric, would not plot strategy, as one observer pointed out. It was incapable of malice or fear. Just who or what would serve to stand in was open to interpretation, an outright manufacture. Some took a microscopic approach, targeting every last viral particle and fraction of residue for chemical annihilation. In Jamaica, it was a bus passenger who happened to sneeze who was seized upon, beaten up and thrown out on the road by his fellow passengers. In Australia, it was a man who suffered cardiac arrest on the street outside a Chinese restaurant. Convinced they'd glimpsed the invisible microbial enemy inside him, the crowd gathered around, watching him die rather than provide life-saving CPR. 
During the 19th century's cholera pandemics, doctors were stoned in the streets and quarantine hospitals burned to the ground by angry mobs. During the COVID-19 pandemic, doctors in upstate New York were spat on and nurses emerged from late night shifts to find the tires on their cars slashed. In Indore, India, a health a healthcare worker in light blue scrubs walking through a narrow alley was attacked and chased by an angry shouting mob. In the White House, a frustrated and overwhelmed president blamed the World Health Organization. With fingers pointed at the Chinese, at the animals, at a lab somewhere, at political enemies, at shadowy international authorities, the virus quietly spread, undeterred. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks, Sonia. Um, Paolo? Yes, Please. curiously, we're covering different moments of the epidemic. so. My brief forward uh, brings us back. It, it sounds today as I reread it as some sort of historical book already. Yeah. Uh, I'm writing this on a rare February 29th, a Saturday of the sleep year. The confirmed global cases of infection have surpassed the 85,000 threshold, almost 80,000 in China alone. I mean, yesterday we passed 1 million deaths. And the death toll is around 3,000. Those numbers have been my silent companion for the past month. Italy, much to everyone's surprise, has also found itself leading the race in this anxious competition. This has happened entirely by chance. In a few days, suddenly, unexpectedly, other countries could find themselves in even worse conditions. At this moment of crisis, the expression in Italy has no meaning. There are no borders, regions, neighborhoods. The nature of what we're going through is above identities and cultures. The epidemic is the ultimate proof of how our world has become globalized, interconnected, inextricable. I decided to make use of this void by writing. Writing can sometimes be an anchor that helps us stay grounded and hold back fear. But there is also another reason. I don't want to lose what the epidemic is revealing about ourselves. Once the emergency is over, any temporary awareness will also disappear. That is the nature of illnesses. As you read these pages, the situation will have changed. The numbers will be different. The epidemic will have spread further. It will either have reached every corner of the globe or it will have been stopped. But some of the reflections emerging from the contagion will still apply because what is happening isn't a random accident or a scourge and it's nothing new either. It has happened before and it will happen again. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'm going to I'm going to pick up on something that you mentioned uh, in your reading, uh, Paolo. Uh, I noticed a uh, headline uh, this morning, probably the same one that all of you all saw breaking news. The coronavirus has killed at least one million people around the globe. There is no end in sight. So this makes me um, this sort of brings me back to the pandemics that you all have written about that preceded the coronavirus. And um, I guess, you know, the first question is from your research, how do pandemics tend to resolve? How do pandemics end? <laughs> do, do they uh, end? <laughs> I well, don't know if they do end. Do they end? Yeah, that yeah. is a question. Mm -hmm. I give a very short answer. They tend to end with a whimper rather than a bang. Mm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Agree. Agree. But of course, I mean, the biggest recent pandemic of modern times is still with us. I'm talking about HIV AIDS. Um, it didn't end. Um, and I think there's every prospect that COVID could go the same way. It could just become an endemic infection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we still have cholera. I mean, cholera is our most successful pandemic causing pathogen. We've had seven pandemics and the seventh one's going on right now, just a few hundred miles off the coast of Florida and Haiti. So. Um, I mean, I think this is the big uh, accomplishment of microbes over humans is that 
we don't change enough so that they, they can continue infecting us. And this is why they've been so successful. I mean, you think about the billions of years that they were here before we were, you know, even our earliest ancestors were here. It, it's their world, not ours. What scares me a lot about this is that uh, I agree with, with Mark and Sonia, but we, everyone is acting as if there is an ending to this and it's very soon and it's a vaccine that we, uh, that is surely going to come because we want it to be there very soon. So uh, especially news that come from the US in that sense, I have to say, are a little frightening for me because they, on, on one side, they show some certainty that I simply cannot find. I mean, you, you mentioned HIV, you mentioned cholera, you mentioned, we can mention so many uh, illnesses that are still there, as you were saying, but somehow we are, we want to be so sure that we're going to have a vaccine and it's going to be soon. And this is causing, I would say, th this has, this is, this is a threat within the threat in my, in my mm. idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a useful distinction between the biological phenomenon of the pandemic and then the social and political phenomenon of the pandemic. And I think, you know, we still have HIV, but we're not living in the panic that was, you know, must much of the 80s when it first came out. And I think the difference is when, um, really, when privileged people can find some kind of way to protect themselves. So, you know, that happened with HIV with new drug cocktails and, and therapeutics that were very expensive at the beginning. But as soon as they came online, you know, it's the, the panic really dissipated because people who were powerful enough to access those could protect themselves. Um, cholera is, is not scary for most people in the world anymore because <clears throat> we have clean water systems now, so we're not at risk of it. And I think the same thing could happen with COVID when we have a therapeutic that, or if we have greater knowledge of who's at risk and a therapeutic that would help for those people, then, you know, the social and political, the panic of it will start to subside. It doesn't mean the pandemic's going to go away because there's still going to be so many people who are still exposed and at risk. But, you know, we live with people around the world are still at risk of malaria and tuberculosis and all these other contagions that we know how to prevent and to treat. Um, but hundreds of thousands of people get sick and die of those every year. Um, and we just, you know, life goes on, the economy goes on. So I think it's really about, you know, who's going to be continued uh, exposed to the risk over time and who's not. Um, can I just say very yeah, please do. I, mean, I agree with most of what both of you said, but I, I don't think I fully share your confident Sonia in um, medicine to solve this pandemic and that's not because I don't think we will have a vaccine at some point maybe in the next 12 months or 18 months. I think it's rather because we're no longer living in this kind of moment that maybe we were in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century where populations trust and have confidence in science anymore. Um, we've seen this particularly in Italy uh, prior to the pandemic with um, people refusing vaccinations for their children. Um, but, you know, even recently in London and Trafalgar Square, there were mass demonstrations by people who don't believe that COVID is actually real. They think the whole thing is a hoax. And uh, we've seen similar uh, movements in America, uh, you know, driven by uh, libertarians, uh, the alt-right. Um, so my worry more is, I agree, it is a social phenomenon as well as a medical phenomenon. I think the difference today is that um, populations no longer have the same faith or trust in medicine and they positively reject medicalization, um, which is why these conspiracy theories um, are so powerful. I, I, I almost see, you know, conspiratorial thinking and rejection of what the numbers are telling us, what science is telling us, is, is almost a bigger threat now. It's the pandemic. Mm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think that's absolutely true. And I think the rise of populism around the world is such a big part of the puzzle of what's happening right now. I mean, we have these sort of multiple crises all at the same time interacting and making each one making the other one harder to respond to. So we have the, the biological crisis of the pandemic, but then we also have 
you know, the, 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 the crisis of climate, the climate crisis going on. And then we also have this governance crisis going on at the same time. And all of those three things make each one harder to, you know, inflame uh, the response to the, to the other one. Um, so, you know, I think I, I see the, the rise of right wing populism around the world is, as a really unexpected part of aspect of this pandemic. I mean, I think Mark, maybe you would agree with me. Like when we were writing about this in the, you know, in the earlier part of the decade, it was just not foreseen at all that say the United States would have such an absolutely chaotic response that the CDC would become sort of this organ of propaganda that people wouldn't trust. I mean, that was never gamed out, you know? That was just absolutely unexpected, right? No, I mean, the CDC was this elite organization whose job it was to go around the world and sort of, you know, firefight these things. But um, yeah, I think we've all had a lesson in exceptionalism, the idea of the fallacy that somehow, you know, European health systems are somehow superior. You know, we've seen that how Asia and even Africa uh, has coped better or responded better than many European and North American Mm. What I noticed about what you were saying, also about the, the attitude of people, uh, in Italy, for instance, the attitude has changed a lot during this month. So now that we're starting the second wave, we don't really understand where we are right now, but there is some tension growing about people are starting to talk about possible new lockdowns and all that stuff. But the attitude is completely changed and uh, most of the people probably wouldn't accept that situation again because the the, the denial has uh, thickened in the meantime but what i see is that and you were mentioning also uh, other countries and i mean we we had that sort of attitude coming from above coming from leaders of, of the governments, which was a big part of the problem in this pandemic. But to me, it all goes back to, um, uh, how can I call it, a sort of contradiction that was within science in, in the very beginning. It was very clear in Italy, but I think also elsewhere, when the scientific community was divided uh, between those who were saying, this is um, this is uh, dangerous, we, we're, we need to act very fast. And another part of the scientific community, they were saying, this is just like a seasonal flu. So this idea of the seasonal flu has been with us since the very beginning and some, somehow it's not being resolved and it won't be resolved. And it's, to me, it's the cause of many of the, um, um, behaviors also that we're seeing growing within the population. Mm. I'd, I'd yeah, agree with that. I mean, sorry, just very quick. I think I'd be fascinated to hear your take on this because I think it all comes down to numbers and how people understand numbers. Um, so, um, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that I, oh, actually, yeah. I, I wanted to follow up on that because. To me, what's so strange about the metaphor of influenza is that, I mean, seasonal influenza is really serious. You know, we, we act like it's used as a metaphor to say like, oh, it's nothing. It's just the flu. Flu kills 100,000 people every year, even though we have herd immunity, even though we have vaccines and we spend tens of billions of dollars every year like creating all that, and then we still lose another tens of billions of dollars a year because people can't go to work. I mean, it's hugely costly. It's a huge burden on our societies. And so to act like, oh, it's just another flu is, is also a kind of strange misunderstanding. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree with that. I think that a, a lot of what you were saying, Paolo, is in the beginning. I, yes, the scientists were divided between, oh, this is the big one, the one we've all been expecting and predicting. Um, and other scientists who are wary of saying that, um, partly because similar predictions have been made in 2009 when the swine flu emerged, and the bird flu in the early uh, 2000s, and they didn't turn out to be severe global pandemic diseases. And they were, the swine flu was a pandemic, just wasn't severe, it wasn't, you know, not much more severe than seasonal flu. Um, but I think influenza has misled as well as informed because um, 
The point about influenza is even when there's a new pandemic strain, there's always cross immunity because several of the proteins uh, we share with the previous pandemic virus. So typically, you know, even in 1918, uh, the pan pandemic ended, to answer your earlier question, when a third of the population had been infected and had um, immunity. And therefore, it, it can know there were not enough susceptibles for it to continue to transmit, or if it did, they didn't get very ill or severely ill. Um, mm. And this is one of the problems with COVID-19. We really don't know. I mean, people use the term herd immunity, uh, which is actually, you know, in the medical history, that's just a term that has been borrowed really from um, veterinary science, you know, the science of herd, herd immunity in, in lives can be applied to human population. Um, you know, the rule of thumb is that this will end when we reach 60 or 70 percent of people who've had COVID and recovered. But we don't know that because we don't know. There's so many unknowns. We don't know, you know, first, we don't know if there's some pre-existing cross immunity, right, which means that we may not actually have this feared second or third wave. Or it could be the other way. It could be we never get full immunity because you don't get persistent um, uh, uh, protection from, you know, antibodies. Um, so we are really, um, you know, science really can't give us the answers now. And I think that also drives distrust and uncertainty about everything that experts might tell us. I want to ask each of you to um, uh, expand on a couple of things that uh, that you've said um, elsewhere. <clears throat> uh, and I just want to read you a couple of things. Uh, Paolo, I'd like to start with you to pick up on, on uh, just this previous conversation. Uh, you'd said that, uh, and forgive me if I'm terribly misquoting here, uh, that uh, this pandemic uh, was a health crisis preceded by a mathematical emergency. <laughs> could you um, could you elaborate on that? Well, as um, I really started uh, looking into this and, and writing the, the the short essay at the end of February, which was, I mean, the the pandemic was. Not yet a pandemic, I think, first of all, because it took some time to call it that. Um, but especially in Europe, and so in all the Western world, the health emergency hadn't started yet. So 10 days after that, uh, the uh, intensive cares of, um, of Lombardy in Italy would be full packed and would be deep into the health crisis but at that moment it was still invisible so you could only see what was about to happen in the growth of numbers i mean it, it was another world compared to this one we it, it's even hard to go back to that moment with the minds because we we had no testing we had no tracing we had nothing basically so we were just counting people that were uh, getting to the hospital and who were already severely sick. Uh, and the numbers that were given to us were growing very, very fast in those days. But there's, there was no, there was nothing to show to people. There was no health emergency. So my point was, I, I knew that we could change the course of the pandemic of the epidemic in Italy in those days still at least a little bit uh, and people needed to understand why and how they needed to behave in a way that now we've learned social distancing and all that um, so my only way to show that was to try and explain the numbers and what what is the difference, for instance, between a linear growth of a phenomenon and a non-linear growth, which is something that maybe to most of us is pretty clear, but not to most of the people. So explaining why an epidemic can grow, not fast, but 
much faster than fast and what does that mm. what that means and, and all that and why we needed to behave in such a way so that's why i called it a mathematical emergency at that point and then we saw the the images of the coffins taken out from bergamo and at that point from that point on everything became clear to everybody but that point was already too late do you feel that the um uh, that the mathematical framework help to shift people's thinking about um, the epidemic? I, I think it helped people to have a clearer vision and so not to panic or panic a little less because we were having very contradictory messages in those early days. It, it happened more or less in every country after, uh, in every country after that. But people were scared uh, mostly because uh, the, what, what everybody was saying wasn't clear at all. So people mm -hmm. were confused. And just by giving a couple of very simple epidemiological tools, which are the, the basis of every mathematical model in epidemiology, uh, what, what I realized from the, from the feedback of readers is that it helped them to be a little more calm, at least, yeah. Increase their understanding. Yes, mm -hmm. Man, which I, is a big part of the problem in, in, during an epidemic, no? Yeah. I, I would say even the biggest part of the problem. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I so want to ask each of you or all of you about uh, uh, panic and fear, uh, but I'm going to build my way up to that one. Uh, but it's something that, that certainly threads through so much of each of your writing. Um, Sonia, you have said that, um, uh, and I think you said this in regards to not simply uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but um, generally around uh, pandemics and epidemics. The story we have been told from the beginning has been one of a passive population suddenly attacked by a foreign being. And um, I want to ask if you, um, uh, well, the, the narrative around this, and, and even going back to, your, to what you shared earlier about the sort of militaristic, we're at war and so forth. How does it, can you elaborate a bit on how that plays into um, just where we are now in terms of our response and our understanding of this moment? Yeah, I think it's been sort of the conceptual framework that we've used to understand contagion, at least since sort of germ theory times, which is that, you know, these are sort of external invaders that come and attack us from outside of us. Um, and you see that in our rhetoric and our narrative and the way we, with the way we name pathogens, for example, if they're from far off places, we'll almost always use that far off place, but it's something, if it's something near to us, then we give it some, you know, more technical name. Mm -hmm. um, um, you see that in the scapegoating that, you, you, you know, often occurs around epidemics where you try to say, well, it's not us, it's them, they're bringing it to us, let's close our borders, let's, you know, sort of protect the, the uncontaminated from the foreign contamination <clears throat> from encroaching upon us. And I think, you know, that is, um, leads to certain policy solutions, which is usually, uh, well, if you have an invader from outside of you, you need weapons to protect yourself. And so those weapons are our vaccines and our drugs and, um, you know, these different biomedical commodities. But what it, and, and that's not, it's not that that's not true. I mean, that is partially true. Of course, that is what's happening on some level. But there's also a lot of agency, our own, you know, we are part of the fabric of all of this. Um, you know, just because you have the germ inside you doesn't mean you're gonna get sick, right? So there's, we know on some level, there's some interaction there. It's not just that we are, you know, uh, these, these passive things that need, you know, these victims of this external um, alien sort of creatures. Uh, our immunity matters, our social relations matter. And then of course, what this whole paradigm really obscures is how much our own activities are what has brought these microbes into our populations. And, you know, this is why experts have been predicting for 
over 10 years that a pandemic like this would occur is because we've had a steady drip of new pathogens like this since around 1940 we've had hundreds of them um, not just you know the last SARS virus but Zika <laughs> Ebola in West Africa, it had never been seen before. Cholera in the Western Hemisphere hadn't been seen there in 100 years. New kinds of tick-borne illnesses, new kinds of antibiotic-resistant pathogens. So all of this was building up, and, and it's because of how we are creating opportunities for mm. microbes that exist in the world elsewhere, harmlessly in bats and in the water and you know, here in, the, in different parts of the environment. And we're building bridges for those microbes to cross over into the, into the human body, whether it's because we're cutting down the forest where the bats live or we're hunting them and bringing them into our markets and putting them next to civet cats or you know, any number of ways in which we are building the highways that bring these microbes into our bodies and turn them into um, pandemic causing pathogens. And I think that's such an important part of this story because, of course, this isn't the last pandemic. You know, we had we already had one SARS virus in 2002, 2003, and we knew another one was coming, and this one has come. And so, you know, and as horrible as this one is, and as disruptive and deadly as it is, there's so many ways in which you can imagine a pathogen that could be worse. You know, that mm. could, could affect, say, you know, primarily young people, for example, rather than elderly people. Um, that could be more deadly or have symptoms that are more scary than this one. This one has symptoms that we're all kind of familiar with in a lot of ways. Um, so I think it's so important for us to get to those root causes. And I think part of that means telling a different story about where this pandemic came from. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, you have said that um, the scientific knowledge of viruses and other infectious pathogens can blind medical researchers to ecological and immuno immunological insights, as well as the epidemic just around the corner, as you, as you read um, uh, in your piece. And also um, the tendency of medical researchers to become pr prisoners of particular paradigms and theories of disease causation, uh, blinding them to these threats, both known and unknown. Uh, is there anything you'd like to elaborate on that? I'd like to elaborate. <laughs> it's, not, it's one of the main <laughs> themes of the book. I mean, it's really summed up by this word of the title hubris, right? This, I, I mean, what, what, what has COVID-19 been? If nothing else, it's been a worldwide lesson in the dangers of hubris and mm. scientific compla complacency of every kind. Scientific complacency, but also complacency of Western governments, that that thing that's happening thousands of miles away in Wuhan, it's never going to come here, it's never going to happen here. We're superior, we're better than that. Um, but I suppose, I mean, to answer your question more directly, um, if we look at the sort of the modern era of epidemics, by which I mean from the turn of the 19th century, from really 1960, 1918, which is the era of modern rational medical science that's really kicked off with epidemiology, the birth of statistical understandings of diseases um, in the uh, end of the 19th century, and then through bacteriology and germ theory, what we've seen is that, um, you know, of course, you know, these scientific understandings of disease have been a huge boon to humankind. I mean, it's meant we've been able to control many diseases, develop vaccines, uh, clean up, you know, the polluted water where um, uh, uh, cholera and typhoid and, you know, other diseases have been killed in Victorian times bred. But as we move progressively further forward into, you know, towards the present day, we've actually seen that uh, scientists are continually being taken by surprise, either by um, familiar pathog pathogens behaving in new ways or unexpected ones. So a really good example of that would be Ebola in West Africa in 2014. You know, prior to the outbreak in 2014, there have been something like 12 large outbreaks of Ebola across Central and Equatorial Africa. But for the main part, those outbreaks began in remote forested regions and never reached a major 
um, urban area. They got quite close, but they never actually got to a major city, right? That all changed uh, in 2014, partly because the outbreak occurred um, in this tri-border region of um, Southeast Guinea with the borders of Sierra Leone and, and uh, Liberia. But more importantly, it was because there'd been um, you know, massive improvement in roads, a new Chinese road all the way from Freetown uh, to the border of Guinea, likewise improved, improved communication on the other side. And then it's a short hop from uh, Freetown and Monrovia to Nairobi or to a European and American city. Um, with Zika in, um, in Brazil, Zika was a virus we'd known about. We had known about Zika since 1947 uh, when it was identified and isolated by uh, entomologists in the Ugandan rainforest. Scientists were not interested in Zika because until 2016, it was just, it was, it was a disease that could cause a rash and a mild flu-like illness, but nobody had ever really spotted um, the incidence of microcephaly, these um, horrific neurological disorders in young children. Um, and, you know, there had never been a Zika outbreak in Brazil or South America. Um, when that happened, of course, everyone was taken by surprise. So what, what we're really seeing is what I try and argue in my book is that it really comes down to this, this problem, come really in the philosophy of knowledge, um, the idea that you know, there are things we know about, um, so-called known knowns, but there are also these other categories, you know, the unknown unknown. So disease X, this category of disease X, uh, which are World Health Organization, uh, World Health Organization came up with after the Zika epidemic, was precisely because scientists are recognizing we keep on being caught unawares. So we need to actually have a placeholder in the international health regulations for a disease that we don't even know about yet, but could hypothetically pose a threat. Mm. But we've also seen that there's this other category, which I think is almost as important, and that is the unknown known. So an unknown, it's, coronavirus is a perfect example. We, it's not the first coronavirus, as, as Sonia pointed out. SARS-1 in 2002-03 was a coronavirus. Common colds, uh, I think something like a third of them, are caused by coronaviruses. So we've known about them for a long time, but there's still so much we don't know that is unknown. And that's true even up to the present moment, right? We still don't really know why this particular coronavirus is so much more transmissible um, than SARS-1, why it seems to cause severe illness in some people but not in other people, and, and something that you know I'm increasingly interested in when you asked how do pandemics end, we now have a category of patients who are having these persistent long-haul symptoms, COVID long-haulers, right? And you know, these are people who got ill in February and March and they're still ill, right? And for them, the pandemic may not end. It may be something they have to live with, the consequences for the rest of their lives. Mm. Uh, I can't thank you all enough for participating in this conversation. And uh, Ernie and everyone who is uh, watching this, I encourage you, if you have not yet, to pick up the books by these authors because uh, there's just so much there. We really scratched barely the surface of it. Uh, uh, thank you, Paolo, Sonia, and Mark. Um, Everyone, please remember you can order books uh, in the link below. Please also consider making a donation to the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is celebrating its 15th year of presenting free literary programming. Uh, they would greatly appreciate that. Okay, thank you all. Thank you all so much. And I hope, we can all, I hope we can all thank stay you, in Brian. touch and that you stay in touch with each other. Yes. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.